Well, when God revealed his personal name to Moses in Exodus 6, a defining moment occurred. Before that point, people would only know God by his titles, but not by his personal name. Our guest's new book, To Know Him by Name, reveals the power and the promises of that knowledge. Please welcome Messianic Rabbi Schneider. Come on in, Rabbi. Thank you for having me. Sure. Nice to see you. Good to see you. So how are you and Miss Cynthia doing? We're doing well, praise God, yes. Life keeps changing. One thing my dad said to me that I never forgot, he said, the only thing that never changes is change itself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I've aged a little bit, taking better care of my body, dealing with a few skin issues, but other than that, Joni, Doug, things are going really well. Praise God. God That's keeps good. doing new things. That's good. Amen. Well, I want to get into your to your new book. Um, but before we do that, um, it's been a while since you've been on ministry now. And I wanted you just to share a little bit how you came to know the Messiah. Yeah. And because uh, it's such a great story. And yeah. uh, people love testimonies. And people watch Rabbi Kurt Schneider here on Daystar. And uh, it's such a blessing. There you see um, um, discovering the Jewish Jesus, do we have a little clip we can show of that? Let's, let's watch this together. For those of you that don't know about his show, you need to watch it. It's a great, great blessing. Let's watch. Jesus said, he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. So there's a price to pay for this. There's like a, like a dying to the flesh. Jesus said, unless you pick up your cross, deny yourself and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So I'm calling God's children to a place of radical obedience, of denying the flesh, in order to get connected to Hashem, in order to be fused with Father God's Spirit that lives on the inside of you. All right, I love that. You know, uh, we were just in Florida a few months back and met a couple, Clayton and Katie, mm -hmm. and- um, They were so excited about like, that we actually star. knew you. Yeah. They were excited about Daystar, but because they watch Rabbi Schneider and she does a service like for um, her know, church? a messianic Shabbat uh -huh. kind of yeah. for her church and stuff. So we actually called you so you need yeah. to talk to her husband, Clayton. So that has to bless you when you hear about those kind of stories, people watching, people being blessed. It definitely does, especially uh, older people, people that are struggling, Catholic people, all people. But when, yeah. when, when people's lives are changed, I mean, yeah. Let's go back to your family and tell your story because it's, it's a, quite a story. Yeah, yeah. So it was 1978. I was lost in life. I mean, really lost. I mean, if the Lord would not have come to me, I, my life would have been destroyed. And what were you doing in 1978? I was, I was reading a book by, auto, by a guy named Paramanji Yogananda. And he wrote a book called Autobiography of a Yogi. And there were pictures in the book of these swamis from India levitating off the ground. And I always had a really simple faith in God. I believed in God very strongly. And I said, God, if that's real, if this guy is really levitating off the ground, I found my answer. I found my new wrestling, because that's what I used to mm -hmm. do. And I was in the middle of an identity crisis. I didn't know what to do with my life anymore. And, and so I, I just was consuming this book. And I went to sleep in the middle of the read, reading the book. It was a hot August night of 1978. And I was awoken from my sleep into what I would describe as a state of supernatural awareness. Suddenly I was aware that I wasn't mm. sleeping. And in that state, in an instant, Jesus appeared on the cross. It was in color. I could see the ground the cross was staked in. And from above the blue, from above the blue sky, straight from heaven, a red light beamed down on Jesus' head. And when I saw that ray of red light come down on his head, I knew that the light was coming from God because I understood the symbolism it was coming from straight above and that God was showing me that Jesus was the way to him. Amen. And then that quickly my life changed. Oh, praise God. Yeah. Well, I mean, in your family, 
how did they take the news of what? Well, it was terrible. That's I mean, another whole story. Yeah, that's a whole story. I mean, it was very, very painful for them. They were very ashamed. They were very upset. They didn't know if something was wrong with me. And uh, they took some drastic measures to uh, try to keep me from believing in Jesus mm -hmm. and get, get me out of, you know, following, following him. But What was their belief that they were so um, concerned about you? It was, you know what, uh, Dr. Doug, it wasn't even a belief. It was just, I'm a Jew. Jews don't believe in Jesus. Oh, okay, okay, okay. It was just, it just, it just especially my parents' culture, you know, just mm -hmm. like so Jesus and Judaism are like oil and water mm -hmm. in their mind of the traditional Jew. Right. So, yeah, they were just ashamed and upset. But when you say extreme, you mean really extreme. Go ahead and go a little bit into that. Cause... Well, they hired, uh, they hired the most famous new programmer in the country to come and kidnap me from California. I literally was abducted. And the people could can watch. Can you believe this? Can you believe this? I story? believe it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah they, they, my dad told me we were going to go buy a restaurant somewhere. So we went to the hotel room to meet with a business partner. Mm -hmm. But it turned out it was this de de programmer and his goons. And they took me to San Diego where their rehabilitation house was, uh, was set up. And um, yeah, so I was there for several weeks. Um, and, you know, nothing changed because mm -hmm. I wasn't programmed. Right. And I got back home and I decided I was going to try to be a little more tempered. But I was, you know, excited about Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. just kept on talking about Jesus. So then they invited a Jewish psychiatrist over and this whole thing was framed. I mean, they they I think they mm -hmm. had a plan that they knew exactly what they were going to do. They were going to get me probated to a psychiatric ward so they could get me away into an environment to change me. Mm -hmm. And so basically he uh, sat down, he said, you know, was really kind of almost a frail guy, very, uh, you know, very, you know, not an aggressive person at all. He just asked me about my life, he started telling me about Jesus. What would have happened to me if Jesus hadn't come to me, about how he appeared to me. And uh, a couple weeks later, a few weeks, I don't even know exactly, it was a week later, a few days later, but shortly after, I walked into uh, my parents' home. There was a couple suitcases there at the door. They said, look out in the parking lot. They were living in an apartment at the time. I looked out in the parking lot. There was a police car out there. They said that he's waiting for you. Either you come with us voluntarily or they're going to come in here and they're going to take you to the hospital. They had me probated to Mount Sinai Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio on the, on the witness of one psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. So the way that it worked was um, in the law, at the law at the time, a psychiatrist could do that just yep. on his own testimony. But the law was also that after two months, the person that was probated had an opportunity to come before a board of psychiatrists and speak for themselves. Mm. So in two months, I was permitted to go before a board of psychiatrists, share the, you know, the truth about who I was, mm -hmm. and they immediately released me and uh, never looked back, just kept on going. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Very hard, very hard time. Did you, um, did that strengthen your faith in God through that process? Did you find Jesus to be more real or did you think, wow, what am I doing? I don't know about this. Yeah. It was very scary. It was uh, seeing all these people walking around, depressed, looking like they were going to take their own life. Some of them just total darkness mm -hmm. you can see, and it was it was it was oppressive. I remember being in the hallway, uh, Joni Doug, one day, just feeling like really, like really kind of broken. Mm -hmm. And in that instant, the Lord just showed me His victory over the world. Amen. It was just an instant, just a flash, a vision, just in your mind, and that was so strong. Mm -hmm. So even though it was really hard, I still, you know, was kept by the Lord. Amen. And did, when did the Lord start showing you that he wanted to use you in ministry to um, reach people that were lost? You know, the truth is, my first goal was just to, to be able to be a pastor so I could read the Bible all the time and seek God for myself. I wasn't first thinking about preaching other people. I was thinking about getting more of God for myself. Mm -hmm. You knew that was important to read the Word of God. Oh, yeah. I just loved it. You Where know, did the Lord have you start reading first? Um, gosh, I don't even know. I just remember like reading through the New Testament, like, mm -hmm. you know, in a matter of two days over and over again. Mm -hmm. I would sit down, read a gospel in a whole night. So I don't know where I started first, just devouring it though. And it was like fire coming off the page to me. And when did it translate into, okay, I'm calling you to ministry? Um, so I went away to Bible school because to be a pastor so I could spend all my time seeking God, so I could have his fullness mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. life. And then I thought, okay, well now, you know, now you're graduating, so it's time now to start pastoring. So, you know, I just started pastoring and the engine's always been the word. It's always been the mm -hmm. word. Like when mm -hmm. I preach, this sounds bad, but I'm not even really conscious of the people. So I'm just conscious of the Lord and his word. Um, I'm not a pastor, 
I'm an evangelist. I'm a, I'm a preacher. I, I believe I have some, uh, you know, multiple giftings. But um, so um, I, you might have heard the story about Smith Wigglesworth when the Lord saved him and told him that if you don't preach my word, you're gonna, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> and so he would be in front of churches and he didn't even like the people. I never felt like that. I, God gave me the gift to love people when I started pastoring. Yeah. But I mean, it was the, the goal was always, was always him. I do have a great love for people now. I, I would say certainly as I've matured and as I've aged, I have mm -hmm. a true love for people, a real sensitivity, I think a tenderness for those that I minister to. So to get back to where you were, when I hear testimonies of people's lives being touched by the Lord, I mean, yeah, it melts my heart. But you could have never imagined that you would be doing a TV program that would go around the world and going to Israel and doing all the exploits that God has allowed you to do over the last 10 years. No, no, I really never imagined that. And what's strange is with all the places that we're able to minister now, all the testimonies we receive, I'm still not really that conscious of it. That's a good thing. Yeah, That's I think I'm just so conscious in my own life of overcoming, because mm -hmm. you know, the world's hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. Life is hard for everybody. So I'm just really conscious of just, you know, moving forward in my walk with God, you know, pressing in. I pray for breakthrough all the time and believe for great things, but I still don't think I'm really conscious of the impact that the, in, the, in the way the Lord has used me right it's now. Good. I think it's, I will when yeah, I get a place to face. Yeah, exactly. Well, you, you, you went on to be ministry. You've written multiple books, and this one's called to know him by name. What inspired you to kind of go in this direction and, and hit some of the highlights here? Well, I do have a unique call to teach the Jewish and Hebrew roots of the faith. And I just felt like that was the next subject. It was really mm -hmm. foundational for God's people to understand what God does for them, those that are in covenant with him, through the revelation that he's given us in his Hebrew name in conjunction with what he did for people. So his memorial name forever. Yud Hey Vav Hey, which most Semitic scholars, but those are four Hebrew letters, as you know, which most Semitic scholars believe is pronounced a breathy Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So Yahweh revealed himself to Moses and he said, Your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, knew me as El Shaddai, as God Almighty. That's a title. Mm -hmm. He said, But by my name, and then he breathed his name, Yahweh. They did not know me. This is my memorial name forever. Mm -hmm. So the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, his name is Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And then what Yahweh did is he kept revealing himself to Israel and he joined his name with what he did. So for example, at the waters of Marah, the poison waters in the book of Exodus chapter 15, mm -hmm. where the water made people sick. Mm -hmm. Moses called upon the Lord. The Lord healed the water it's interesting, uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dick, he did it with a hyssop branch, yep. an agent. He used an agent, which tells me God sometimes uses medicine. He sometimes uses doctors. Mm -hmm. He heals directly, but he uses agents too. But what happened was he healed the water, and then he said to Moses, I am Yahweh Rapha or Yahweh Rofecha. I am the Lord, your healer. Mm -hmm. So Yahweh connected himself to what he does for his people through the revelation of his name. From, Yahweh from who he is. To know who he is, no, what he does. From, from who he is. From he, who he is. From who he is. Yeah. He manifests in the healer and several other names you go through here. I'll let you do that uh, conversation. Yes. Anything you want to? So when you were going through these names, were there any as you studied that surprised you where you maybe thought you understood the meaning mm -hmm. and then the Lord gave you a greater understanding as to how the name would relate to knowing him? Um, well, a title of God that really brought new revelation as I began to study the Hebrew is the, is the title Elohim. So the first verse in the Bible, in the beginning, God, that the Hebrew is there, Elohim, which is the plural form of the Hebrew word, El. And El just means God. Mm -hmm. So when you add Im onto the end of the word, El becomes plural, Elohim. So in the beginning, Elohim, God in plural form, created the heavens and the earth. And then the text continues where the Lord says in Genesis 1, let us, so who's the us? Mm -hmm. First he's Elohim, God in plural form, let us make man in our image. Amen. So what we have there is the revelation of the multidimensional nature of the Godhead. In Judaism, as you know, as a mm -hmm. Jew, the singular uh, most uh, common understanding of who God is is that there's only one God. Monolithic, yeah. Yeah, that's why we reject Christianity, because we don't believe in Father, Son, and Spirit. We believe God is one. Mm -hmm. But from the beginning, the Lord has revealed that he's multidimensional. 
And of course, the most Hebrew, uh, the most uh, famous Hebrew declaration of Judaism is the Shema. Hear Israel, the Lord our God, yes. Lord is one. Right. Echad. You know, which is interesting because when you look at it logically, when you see how God did creation, if, if God was one, he would have been fine with just Adam. Adam would have been enough. Mm. But because he's triune, he first created Adam, then he created Eve, and then his final masterpiece is he created marriage, in which he was the head of this trinity yeah. on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. And so it's kind of funny, let's mathematically, like if God was just one, he would have just been fine with Adam. <laughs> one son, yeah, right? But he wasn't. He wanted to have a trinity on earth as it is in heaven so that children could go up in the presence of God. You know, and so we see, uh, anyway, we have that conversation. This, this book is really, really good, and we're going to get more into it in a little bit. But, you know, many of you, you're out there and you're, you're watching and you just heard a crazy testimony. You don't have to go through all that when you accept Jesus, okay? Or you can accept Jesus right now in your home if you've walked away from him or if you have this, this desire, like, I just don't know this God this, the, that you're talking about who goes all the way back from the Scripture to today, who opens doors, who does miracles like uh, the team sang about. Well, you can know him. And it's not that hard. You just open your heart. You can say something as simple as this. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I make you Lord right now. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to obey you. I want to follow you. Just that kind of message to the Father. And he'll save you right where you are. He really will. And we want to send you something. We want to send you uh, the Gospel of John. Not an ordinary Gospel of John. It's got a QR code so you can do this with your phone. And Dr. Gene Getz will share with you what you just read. And we have another book called For You, Now What? Which will help you walk out your faith. If you said that prayer, I need you to call that number 1-800-329-0029 because we want to get that stuff to you. We want you not only to be saved, we want you to grow. Like, you know, Pastor Rabbi Schneider, he, that little seed grew into a whole tree. God can do mighty things with you. I'm excited to share with you revelation that God gave us concerning his covenant name. And the reason I think this is important is that knowing God has revealed himself to us as a person, because people have names, and then seeing what the Lord revealed to us in terms of what he does for us through his names when we're in covenant with him, opens up our heart to believe him to do for us what he said he was going to do. So let's begin today by going to the book of Shemot or Exodus. I'm going to Exodus 6, chapter, uh, uh, verses number 2 and 3 there. Hear the word of God. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord abides forever. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, many of you have heard the term El Shaddai, the title El Shaddai, this is God Almighty. I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name, and then the Lord breathed his personal covenant name to Moses, composed of the four Hebrew letters, yud heh vav -Hey, which most Semitic scholars believe is pronounced a breathy Yahweh. So the Lord said to Moses, your forefathers knew me as God Almighty. They knew me as El Shaddai. But by my name, Yahweh, they did not know me. I did not make myself known. And then the Lord went on to say, this is my memorial name forever. So the covenant memorial name of Father God is Yahweh. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ is Yahweh. What happens from this point forward in the Torah is that the Lord connects his covenant name with the things that he does for us as we're in covenant with him. So I want to go to God's covenant name, Yahweh Rophecha, also referred to as Yahweh Rapha, which has to do with our ability to be able to trust him to be the healer of our bodies. We're going to go now to the book of Shemot or Exodus chapter number 15. What is taking place at this point in Israel's journey 
is that they came upon some waters that were gathered at a place called Marah. And these waters at Marah that the children of Israel needed to drink were toxic. They were poison. They were called bitter waters. That's what Marah means. And so Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord told Moses to take a hyssop branch, to put the hyssop branch in those toxic waters that made his people sick. And when Moses put the hyssop branch in the waters, in the toxic water, the Lord cleansed it. And then the Lord said to Moses, I am Yahweh Rapha, I am Yahweh Rophecha, I am the Lord, your healer, or I am the Lord that healeth thee. So let's just read the word. Exodus 15, verse 26. The Lord says there, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of the Lord, to Yahweh, your God, and to do what is right in his sight. By the way, whenever you see the, the, in, your, in your Bible, in the Old Testament, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Whenever you see the word Lord in all caps, what is actually in the original Hebrew text is yud heh vav -Heh, God's covenant name, Yahweh. So what it actually says here, if you will give earnest heed to the voice of Yahweh, your God, and do what is right in his sight, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have put on the Egyptians, for I, Yahweh, am your healer. And I remember years ago, I was getting ready to go to Africa. I was I had a huge outreach plan there. And the day before the outreach, I started getting really bad pains in my heart. And so the next day, occurred. I'm still having the pain in my heart. So I call my doctor. It's a Friday. The doctor says, come on in, and I, I want to run some tests on you. So the doctor does an EKG on me. I leave the doctor's office, and now I'm beginning my traveling journey. I first was going to minister in Toledo to a con local congregation there, and from Toledo I was flying out to Africa. So I leave the doctor after the EKG and uh, go to Toledo to minister. And meantime, as I'm traveling to Toledo, the doctor calls me. She said, listen, there are some things in your test that we ran. Uh, something doesn't look right. I need you to come back. And I said, I, I said, I can't come back now. I said, I'm, I'm getting ready to, uh, to go to Africa. I, you know, I've got a trip planned. And she said, you need to take your health seriously. Meantime, the pains are coming. I take a heart monitor with me to Toledo. My wife, Cynthia, is monitoring my blood pressure. And the pain's getting worse. And that night, I'm lying in, in, in bed after ministering that evening in Toledo, getting ready to go to Africa in a day. And the pain is getting so bad in my heart, I begin to think, you know, I could have a heart attack and die. And I think, I've got a, I've got a wife and children to take care of. And I think, I'm thinking, I can't go to Toledo. That'd be, I mean, I can't go to Africa at this point. That'd be, that's irresponsible. So I wake my wife up in the middle of the night, and I say, honey, I'm not gonna, I, I can't go to Africa. And this was so unlike my wife. She said to me, you're gonna go to Africa, and the Lord is gonna use you to reach thousands which is really unlike Cynthia. It was just a word from the Lord. She was just speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So when she said that, it brought great comfort to me, and I went back to sleep. But when I woke up the next morning, I still had that pain in my heart. I opened up the Bible, just randomly opened up the Bible, looked down, put my finger down, randomly on a verse. And what did I put my finger down on, beloved one? This verse right here, Exodus 15, 26, where the Lord says, I am the Lord, your healer. So I took great encouragement that God was with me, that I could trust him to bring healing and health and life to my body. As I went to Africa, I went. We reached thousands and thousands of people. Thousands of people gave their lives to the Lord there. And ever since then, I have continually looked to the Lord to bring life and healing to my body. It doesn't mean that I never face physical issues it doesn't mean that I never face health challenges, but what it means that is that in the midst of all the challenges, I'm looking to God, I'm looking to Yahweh Rophecha, to Yahweh Rapha, to be my healer. And beloved, that's what he wants for all his children. He wants us to look to him to be our healer. God uses doctors, 
He can use medicine, even as he told Moses to take a hyssop branch and put the hyssop branch in the waters at Marah, and the Lord used that hyssop branch as an agent to heal the waters and to keep his people healthy. God can use agents, but the problem is we cut ourselves off from our source when we're looking to the agents rather than to the Lord himself to be our healer. So I have found through studying God's Hebrew names, and I go through so many of them in my book, Knowing God by Name, uh, it, 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 it just encourages us to, to believe him to do for us what he says he's going to do. Of course, Jesus went around healing everybody, and so that gives us great encouragement to trust him to be our healer. But when we see it rooted in the Hebrew Bible as well, the roots of our faith go even deeper. Another Hebrew covenantal name of God is Yahweh Makadesh, the Lord our sanctifier from the book of Leviticus. And what I love about this is that a lot of times believers, without knowing it, they come to Yeshua, they come to Jesus by faith and trust him to save them, but then they get Christianized and they start trying to perfect themselves by their own works. They try to sanctify themselves by being a do-gooder. Not that we shouldn't do good, we should do good, but rather than looking to the Lord to complete the process that he began in us, we begin to try to try in our flesh to complete the process ourselves. So when the Lord revealed himself to us as Yahweh Makadesh, the Lord our sanctifier, what it does, beloved ones, is it encourages us to look to the Lord to continue to sanctify us when we see those things in our heart that are wrong, that we don't like. Selfishness, anger, jealousy, hatred, fear, all those things in our heart that we know aren't right. We don't have to make our heart right ourselves. Rather, we look to our source. We look to the one that revealed himself as the Lord, our sanctifier, Yahweh Makadesh, and we call out to him trusting in his grace to continue to cleanse us, to continue to heal us, and to continue to bring sanctification to us. So knowing God by his covenant names encourages us to look to him and to believe in him to do for us what he says he does for those that are in covenant with him. Remember Yeshua said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yahweh is the Father, and the greatest way we can know God is as Father. Consider this. When the Lord said to Moses, your forefathers knew me as El Shaddai, God Almighty, that's a title, but by my name, yud heh vav -Hey, Yahweh, they did not know me, what that does is it presses on our hearts the revelation that God is a person with a name. He's a person with a name. And that brings God closer to us. Because a lot of times we believe in God, but we believe in him as someone that's far away, up in the clouds somewhere. We pray to him, you know, that God's all powerful. He does what he wants and, you know, he answers our prayers, but he's far away. But knowing God has a name, that he's a person with likes and dislikes, brings the revelation of how near he is to us, closer to our hearts, and knowing, beloved one, that Yahweh is a person with likes and dislikes that he's named in the Torah, helps us to understand that if we're going to walk with him in fellowship, we have to be sensitive to this person, Yahweh, and to what he likes and what he dislikes. I, re I remember reading not long ago in the book of Ezekiel where the Lord spoke to Ezekiel and he said to Ezekiel, my people have hurt me because of their adulterous ways. Now just think about this. God said, my people have hurt me. H-U-R-T. Did you ever consider the fact that you can hurt God, that little old you and little old me, that we have somehow the power that our creator has given us, the power to be able to hurt him, 
That's mind-blowing to me, that I can hurt God. God is the most sensitive. Yahweh is the most sensitive and humble person in all the universe, and he can be hurt. And so knowing that helps us to carry ourselves in such a way that we're more sensitive to his spirit. And we become more aware of our energy and our thoughts and our heart and our motives because God is so close to us and he's a person. And I think about when Yeshua wept, when the people that were after Lazarus had died, how they were all weeping there. And remember, Yeshua is God incarnate. He's God clothed in humanity. Why did Yeshua weep? Because he felt them. He felt them, and he was identifying with their feeling. And that's how close, beloved ones, he is to you and I. Father, in Yeshua's name, I pray that you would give each one of us a greater ability and a greater sensitivity to your spirit to recognize that you're a person. That, Father, we can hurt you or we can bring you joy. Father, we welcome the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Father, we repent of not being more sensitive to you of only thinking that you're all powerful and not recognizing how humble and how sensitive you are. That you're standing at the door of our heart knocking and waiting to come in deeper as we open our heart deeper to you. So Father, we turn to you right now. We ask you to cleanse us of everything in us that's out of alignment with you. Holy Spirit, we ask you to bring us into alignment with the will of the Father. And Father, I speak supernatural shalom and peace over everyone that's watching this broadcast, over everyone that's under the authority, Father God, of the sound of my voice through your spirit. Father, break in, I pray, and bring us under your shalom. Father, still our soul, I pray. Cause the roots of our soul to grow deep in the realm of eternity. Reveal your beauty to us, I pray today, Father. Reveal your beauty and the beauty of Jesus to us today. Help us to fall in love over and over and over again with your increasing emanation of love and beauty that you're revealing to us. Father, we love you and we worship you today. We give you our hearts. And I speak over everyone right now that's dealing with illness in your body. And I say in the name of Yeshua of Nazareth, be healed by his stripes, my friends. We are healed. Let's keep on clinging to him, our source of health and life. Dr. Doug, would you come please? Rabbi, thank you so much. That was an encouraging word. And we have people call from all over the world. If you just lay your hand on these and just pray for these, and we'll go out with the praying. Amen. Father God, in Yeshua's name, we don't take lightly the needs of your people. Father, your tenderness towards your people, your love for your people. Yeshua, how you were moved with compassion when you saw us as sheep without a shepherd, when you saw us in our struggles and in our problems. So, Father, I know that you feel exactly like that about all these that have sent in their prayer requests today. We lift them up to you, Father God. We lift up your people, their needs. We thank you for your heart towards them, Father. And we declare over them, Father, your victory, your wholeness, your healing over their lives. Father, thank you for kissing us through Messiah Jesus.